want to share with you this morning a passage of scripture from Paul's letter to the Galatians. I'll be reading from the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 7. Listen now for God's word for you. Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Well, near the top of my list of sermon starters uh, is this insightful little yarn about a farmer and his donkey who lived and worked in beautiful Chinkapin, North Carolina. Yes, it's a real place. Check it out on the map. It's right next to Beulahville, North Carolina. It came to pass that the old donkey got sick one summer morning, so the farmer called his vet who looked the mule over, diagnosed his problem, and prescribed for him some very large and foul-tasting pills. Give the donkey one pill three times a day for a week, and he's going to recover, said the vet, but here's the deal. He ain't going to like the taste of the pill, so I'm going to give you this long plastic tube. Put one end in the donkey's mouth, slip a pill into the other, and blow, before the donkey will know what's happening, the pill will be down his throat. Well, the next day, the farmer was already waiting in the office when the vet arrived for work. Holy cow, said the vet, you look awful. What in the world happened? To which the farmer replied, the donkey blew first. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the way that it goes on some days. There are those times when life does us before we can do it, making us swallow some large and very bitter-tasting pills. A few years back, I preached a sermon series entitled Four-Letter Words. I'm thinking about rolling out a refreshed Four-Letter Words 2.0 here later this fall. As you might imagine, it generated a fair amount of interest just on title alone, and it was a great springboard to talk about the four-letter words that Christians often use quite glibly. Some of the four-letter words were pretty predictable, love, hope, pray. But one particular Sunday, I preached on the word, ouch. It resonated in a way that I would never have predicted as my people began to think through where God was and wasn't and is or isn't when pain and bitter pills make their way to our front door. I began the sermon that day with a rhetorical question. What makes your preacher say, ouch? The answer, it's that moment when I feel powerless, impotent, unable to take your pain away. It's the pain I feel when I get an index card tucked inside an envelope handed to me by a church member on the way out the door on a Sunday morning. I'm a broken man, I read. My marriage is on life support. If only I had paid more attention. If you feel led, please contact me on my cell number. It's the pain I feel when I read this email. Bob, I really don't want this to be a complaint about my life. I'm sure God has dealt me the cards that I have for a reason. I know there are so many people who have it far worse than I do, but sometimes I can't help but be scared and afraid and sad and alone. I pray a good bit. I try to be thankful for the good things I have. I try not to worry. I try not to do anything without God's help. I'm not perfect. My life certainly reflects that. Money is tight. There's not much freedom, and there's a lot of stress. If only I could just call you or make an appointment. But it's hard since my husband would be really mad that I talk to you. He can be a really nice guy 
or a really not so nice guy. I get the latter more than I do the former. I have no friends or family to talk to, but I've said enough for now. If you don't mind, would you pray for me? Or it's the pain I feel when I open up a card on a Friday afternoon in response to a letter I wrote to the sister of a church member who lost her 21-year-old son to a self-inflicted death. This is what I read in the card through my tears. Dear Bob, you've touched me with your note. Nicholas was an unusual child who grew up strong and beautiful and brilliant. He had a sensitive mind, ultimately was a man too gentle to live among the wolves. The pain of living affected him, I think, even though his future was so bright. I miss him terribly. I'm haunted by the if-onlys and the what-ifs. If only I had listened better. What if I'd done this instead of that? My husband's heart is broken too, but we both bleed tentatively, keeping in the hurt, letting the sadness trickle out just a little bit every day, lest we die of grief. Thank you for your prayers. We let the sadness trickle out just a little bit every day, lest we die of grief. That right there is what makes a preacher say, ouch. What if, if only, they cascade down like water from Niagara Falls? If only I hadn't been so harsh on our son, he wouldn't have rebelled. If only I'd been a better son, my parents would still be married. If only I'd stood up to my alcoholic dad, I wouldn't feel so helpless in all my relationships. If only I had visited my mother before she died. It's difficult to identify two words that have contributed to more regret. What if? If only. Which is why it seemed timely to address both then and now, a word that is so often a barrier to belief, a word that is often a catalyst to walk away from God and walk away from life. Often the ifs go hand in hand with the ouches. So I want to talk for just a few minutes this morning about ouch and finish up with a word about if. I chose ouch on that Sunday in 2014, because I think it's such a descriptive word, it gathers up so many other four-letter words, whether it is our past that plagues us, whether it's something we fear, whether it's an emotional or spiritual or physical hurt that we don't think can heal, or whether we feel as if we wait in vain for God to show up Ouch is real. In his book entitled Shattered Dreams, a great read, by the way, the Christian psychologist Larry Crabb tells of a man who suffered an enormous loss, the loss of his child. Crabb describes the man's friends as concerned and supportive, sending him books on handling grief, sending letters to express their love. When his friends called or visited, however, the first question was always, how are you doing? He hated the question the first time he heard it. He hated it more every time thereafter. He knew the right answer, the one his friends were hoping to hear, the one that had more to do with relieving their concern than expressing his own heart. Their hoped-for answer could be expressed many ways, but its message was the same. You know, it's hard, but I'm okay. I'm getting better. I'm getting there. He'd say that, and his words had their intended effect. His most recent questioner smiled with relief and said, oh, I'm really glad to hear that. I'm not surprised, though. Lots of us have been praying for you. And as the struggling man listened to his friend, he felt a wave of intense loneliness sweep over him. He returned the smile, but his soul shriveled behind a wall, 
that left him lifeless, more desperate, more alone than before. Now, Larry Crabb speaks a really important truth here, so listen up. When the bottom falls out of someone's life, it is not particularly necessary or comforting to try and cheer them up. No matter how well intended, such overtures create pressure that adds to their distress. Not only are they suffering, but now they feel bad about how they're making their friends feel. Or they feel bad about the disconnect between where they'd like to be and where they actually are. In preacher world, this is often known as classic glory road theology. A theology of glory from the Baptist church that Roger and I came from sees God at work in the victories of life rather than in the defeats. So the role of the Christian is to help his or her fellow believers get back on the glory road whenever they suffer a setback. The underlying assumption is that if the Holy Spirit is working, the sufferer should begin to feel better. Contrast that with the theology of the cross, which allows us to love and serve a suffering person independent of whether or not or how fast they're healing. We can walk with these people in their present pain as opposed to impatiently focusing on their future health. It is far better to say to someone, tell me more about your pain. The theology of the cross underscores the vital truth that God is in the middle of the pain, not waiting on the other side of it. The theology of the cross is on display in my favorite chapter of scripture, Romans 8. Here's what we read beginning in verse 26. The spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. It's a beautiful line. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. If God is for us, who is against us? I've told you before that Romans 8 is the entire Bible in one chapter. It's golden. And what I just read might be the most encouraging passage in all of Scripture. The Spirit prays in our place, verse 26. He intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. When we're exhausted, depressed, fatigued, hopeless, wordless, besieged by the bitter pills, the what-ifs, the if-onlys of life. He prays when we don't know how or what to pray for ourselves. The linchpin to Paul's theology and ours is found in Romans 8, 28, a promise that God is always on the job, always at work, always working in the pain, the exhaustion, the what-ifs on our behalf to bring some kind of good out of some kind of bad. And Paul brings home truth in Romans 8.31. If, if, if God is for you, who can be against you? It doesn't mean you get instant victory. It doesn't mean life still won't be, on many occasions, a big bag of manure. It doesn't mean that you should just be able to snap out of it or get over it, it does mean that you can lean on and rest in the promise that the Spirit will pray for you when you can't. It does mean you can stand in your desperation and your fear and hear a faint but firm whisper, if I am for you, who can be against you? It means whatever your ouch is, Whatever your fear is, whatever part of your past that you can't get over, whatever hurt you have that feels like it will never heal, whatever your what if is, there is a promise on which you can lean and a provision that God is making on your behalf. There is hope in the promise of Romans 8, and there is a lesson for us. Learn to see the world as the broken person that you are, and you will then be able to see more clearly the broken places of the people around you. Now, one of the places that I'm tapping in to the ouch and the Romans 8 
life is through the writings and the doings of a young woman I think is really wise named Hannah Brenchner. I'm going to ask you to read today some of her work, and I want you to sign up on her website, which I'm going to give you right now, more love letters, more love letters, all one word, dot squarespace.com. If you didn't write it down, get it from me at the back door. But I want you to listen to these words she writes. Here's the first thing to know, she says. You're not alone. It feels like it, but you aren't. I say that with confidence, she says, because I used to think I was alone too. I was ashamed of the way the word depression sounded when a therapist diagnosed me, so I kept it like a secret between my lips. The only time I ever came out and said it, that I felt like I was falling apart, was in a letter. It was a letter I wrote and left on a train in New York City. It wasn't just one letter either, it was dozens of them. I would write them to strangers I would see, and I would tuck them into library shelves and coat pockets and department stores and all over coffee shops in Manhattan where people would stumble upon them and then read them. My first year after graduating from college, I was obsessed, she says, with writing and leaving love letters all over New York City. I blogged about the letters I was leaving after a little while, and I left a pretty wild promise sitting on the internet. If you need a love letter, I will write you. No questions asked. Just send me an email, and I will handwrite you something and drop it in the mailbox with a stamp. Stories started flooding in. Girls being bullied. Boys wanting to end their lives. People of all ages. People I would never meet. And yet this little voice inside me seemed to say, as I clicked into each story, you are not alone. You are actually surrounded by people who are lonely and sad, and they don't know how to admit it either. Don't think for another second that you're fighting this battle on your own. I spent an entire year, she says, writing letters to strangers after that. And that grew into the global organization that I run today. My life flipped upside down because of that one small action, leaving a love letter. That one thing changed my life. But you know what I learned the most? While the world had always told me that it would be good grades that would teach me and good test scores and good job reviews, that would matter the most for my future? It turns out the world was wrong. It was people. All along, it was people who would grow me and teach me and show me what actually mattered when it comes to being human, when it comes to being hopeful, when it comes to being a little bit lost and being okay with that in this lifetime. People need other people to step up and say the things that they can't believe for themselves. Things like this, you matter, you're not alone, you're beautifully rare, I believe these things for you even if we've never met. My reasoning for that is simple. Once upon a time, I desperately needed someone to look me in the eye and tell me I was here for a reason. I needed them to tell me I could go out there and do amazing things. It wouldn't have mattered if it was a loved one or a stranger I needed to hear it all the same. Words are powerful like that. I met a girl named Sarah, she says, recently at a youth conference where I was speaking. I came off the stage to find her waiting for me, and before I could even catch my breath to say anything to her, she was rattling off every shortcoming she could name. I'm not good at this, and I hate myself for this, and one time I did this, and it made me feel like this, and I self-harmed last week, and sometimes I don't think I ever want to be here. There was this strange sense of insecurity in the way she spoke to me, looking down a lot, fidgeting with her hands as if she were waiting for me to just turn in the other direction and walk away. Instead, I grabbed her shoulders. I drew her in as close as I could and I just whispered into her ear so that only she could hear it. Sarah, you are 
okay. Stop looking for a reason to not be okay. You got up today, you're right here, you are okay to me. It was this really quiet, grace-filled moment. And then she just broke down in my arms, sobbing. And we just sort of rocked back and forth together for a short spell of time. I don't really know how long we rocked for. But I know the battle Sarah has faced. And I know what it feels like to look around and think no one gets it. And I know how it feels to be swallowed by the loneliness. So maybe you need to hear the same thing. You're okay. Stop looking for a reason to not be okay. You need to make a step this week. That's the goal. One step. One step that you've been afraid to make. One step that you know is the thing that must come next. One step. One small action. One tiny thing. If, if you do that, it will change your entire life. Five minutes after Hannah Brencher posted that article, five minutes, there came three responses. The first from Kira Russell, this organization sounds amazing. For you to be willing to send letters to complete strangers in hopes of making them smile and keeping them alive means so much to me. I wish I knew who you were when I was in my dark place. I would love to help. The second, from Sherry Joseph. I just got done thinking about how tired I am of being bipolar, of being scared, of everything. And then I read this. I needed this so badly. You saved my daughter's life a few years ago. I think you saved mine tonight. The third from Sarah Tessitore. My name is Sarah as well. After a long night of no sleep, knowing I have a lot more assignments today and this week and midterms too, I came to this blog not knowing what it was about until I read it. I knew you were talking to a different Sarah in your blog, but this morning it feels like you were talking directly to me. Thank you for posting this. Thank you for sharing. It's what I needed to hear. I can't thank you enough. You have given me hope. I now have what you said to the other Sarah saved on my phone as a constant reminder that I'm okay. I'm okay to someone. Sarah, you're okay. Stop looking for a reason to not be okay. You got up today. You're right here. You're okay to me. Thank you so much. Here are the two truths that Hannah Brenchner is leaning into. You reap whatever you sow. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if, if, if we do not give up. Galatians 6. If, if God is for you, who can be against you? Romans 8, 31. There's a story I heard some years ago. Elizabeth Ballard wrote it as a novella several years back tale about a teacher named Jean Thompson and one of her students, a little boy named Teddy Stollard. Teddy was one of those souls who was incredibly disinterested in school, always wore wrinkled clothes, hair was never combed, unmotivated, distant, sometimes just plain hard to like. And even though Miss Thompson said that she loved everybody in her class the same, She really wasn't being truthful. She had a hard time understanding how someone could really be as disconnected from life as Teddy was. Perhaps, perhaps she should have known better. She had Teddy's records. She knew more about him than she wanted to admit. The records read, first grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and his attitude, but he has a really poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. His mother's seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy's a good boy, 
but he's too serious. He's a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but he's well-behaved. His father shows no interest. Came time for Christmas in Miss Thompson's fifth grade class. The boys and girls, as they're wont to do, brought Christmas presents and then crowded around her desk to watch her open them up. Among them was one from Teddy Stollard. She was surprised, actually, that he had bought a gift, but he had. It was wrapped in brown paper held together with scotch tape. On the paper were these simple words for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell this gaudy rhinestone bracelet, half the stones missing, and a bottle of $2 perfume. Some of the other boys and girls began to giggle and smirk about Teddy's gift, but Miss Thompson silenced them by putting on the bracelet and putting some of the perfume on her wrist and holding it up for the other children to smell. Doesn't this smell lovely, she said. And the children, of course taking their cue from their teacher, readily agreed. At the end of the day when school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered for just a second. He slowly came over to Miss Thompson's desk and said, you know, you smell just like my mother. Her bracelet looks really pretty on you, too. I'm glad you like my presence. When Teddy left, Miss Thompson put her head on her desk and asked God to forgive her. The next day, when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. It was still Miss Thompson. Something had changed. She rededicated herself to loving her children, doing things for them that would live on long after she was gone. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of that school year, Teddy had shown dramatic improvement. He actually caught up with some of the students, was even ahead of a few. The end of school came and went. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time, and then one day she got this note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I'll be graduating second in my high school class. Love, Teddy Stollard. He wrote her periodically. Four years later, another note came. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me that I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. University hasn't been easy, but I love it. Love, Teddy. The letters continued, four and a half years later came this one. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th, to be exact. I want you to come. I want you to sit where my mother would sit if she were still alive. Daddy died last year. You're the only family I have. Love, Teddy. So many reasons Teddy could have folded. So many reasons Jean Thompson could have justifiably cared for the other kids in the class instead of the chronic screw-up Teddy Stollard. So many ouches, so many what ifs that could have taken their toll. But Gene Thompson and Hannah Brenchner, they leaned into broadcasting a bigger truth. Maybe the greatest truth of all. If God is for you, who can be against you? You will meet your Teddy Stollard this week. Maybe at the grocery store, maybe at the restaurant, maybe right across the dining room table from you. Every day, everyone you know faces life with eternity on the line. Life has a way of beating people down. 
Every life needs a cheering section. Every life needs a shoulder to lean on. Every life needs a hugger to wrap some arms around them. Every life needs to hear a voice saying, don't give up. Be that voice for Christ's sake. Be that voice.